This talk is about pancreatitis. Here's the outline of what we'll discuss. We'll start by talking about clinical and imaging background information, then we'll move on to the imaging findings of acute pancreatitis. Namely, we'll discuss the Balthazar CT severity index and the revised Atlantic classification of fluid collections. We'll move on to talk about complications, chronic pancreatitis, and we'll conclude with a discussion of autoimmune pancreatitis. So we'll start with some background information. How do you diagnose acute pancreatitis? It can either be with a light pace or amylase over three times normal, with a clinical history of acute, persistent, severe epigastric pain, or characteristic imaging findings of acute pancreatitis, which we'll discuss in this lecture. And you need two of the three of these for diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. What are the causes of acute pancreatitis? Well, about 45% of cases are caused by gallstones, 35% by alcohol, 20% are idiopathic, and other causes account for the remaining 10% which include medications, hypertrichosideremia, ductal obstruction such as by tumor, post-ERCP pancreatitis, hereditary pancreatitis, trauma, and of course the heavily tested scorpion bite. On the other hand, chronic pancreatitis is caused by alcohol abuse in 70% of cases, it's idiopathic in 20%, and other causes account for the remaining 10%, which include, but are not limited to, autosomal dominant hereditary pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, and pancreas divism, among other causes. What's the role of imaging in pancreatitis? Well, it helps establish a diagnosis. It can help identify a cause, so you may see cholodocolithiasis or biliary dilation. It helps assess the severity with the uh, Balthazar CT severity index, for example, and it helps detect complications of pancreatitis. Now let's talk about CT scanning technique. What's the optimal time to perform a CT? Well, that's 48 to 72 hours after symptom onset because that allows for better identification of parenchymal necrosis, which is an important prognostic indicator. And how do we protocol it? Usually a single phase portal venous phase abdominal pelvic CT is sufficient, but if there's concern for a mass or vascular complications, then a pancreatic parenchymal phase at 40 seconds would be necessary. So that's it for background. Now we'll move on to the imaging findings of acute pancreatitis. The imaging findings of acute pancreatitis are well described by Dr. Balthazar in his CT severity index. Uh, so he described a grading of pancreatitis and also a grading of pancreatic necrosis. And each of these findings are possible findings of pancreati pancreatitis, and each of them has a different number in parentheses, which is a point system. You can see the point scale for pancreatic necrosis is more than for the general grading uh, because pancre pancreatic necrosis is such an important prognostic indicator. So we may see a normal appearance on CT, that's a grade A pancreatitis. You may see an enlarged pancreas, uh, that's grade B. You may see peripancreatic fat stranding, that's grade C. You may see one fluid collection, that's grade D, and two fluid collections would be a grade E pancreatitis. So if there were fluid collections on both sides of the abdomen, Dr. Balthazar would call that a grade E pancreatitis. And pancreatic necrosis is defined as non-enhancement of a portion of the pancreas. So uh, anything less than 30 Hounsfield units, or it looks like water, uh, would be pancreatic necrosis. Uh, so if the pancreas enhances completely, there would be no pancreatic necrosis. And then the degree was graded as less than 30%, 30 to 50% necrosis, or over 50% necrosis, with each of these uh, being more points. And you add up the points, and that's your CT severity index, with 0 to 3 points being a mild acute pancreatitis, 4 to 6 points being a moderate acute pancreatitis, and 7 to 10 points being a severe acute pancreatitis. So this is a 74-year-old male. What's the diagnosis? So this is an axial abdominal pelvic CT with IV and positive oral contrast. You can see around the pancreas, there's peripancreatic fat straining, but also there's a fluid collection. Uh, the portion of the pancreas I showed you enhances completely. So what is the Balthazar CT severity index? Well, it would be grade D because there's one fluid collection and there's no necrosis. So this would have a score of 3 which is a mild acute pancreatitis. Um, there are prognostic implications of this. So a severe acute pancreatitis is associated with morbidity over 90% and a mortality over of 17%. So now let's talk a little bit more about pancreatic necrosis. So Dr. Balthazar described this pancreatic necrosis, uh, less than 30 Hounsfield units in the pancreas, but there's also peripancreatic necrosis. So the pancreas is basically surrounded by fat, so the fat around the pancreas can necrose, and uh, basically you'd see a collection with fat or any heterogeneity in it, and that's when you would call a peripancreatic necrosis. And of course, you can get a combination of pancreatic and peripancreatic, which is most cases. 
the revised Atlanta classification incorporated this peripancreatic fat necrosis into a description of pancreatitis. Now, this is the revised Atlanta classification of fluid collections in acute pancreatitis, and this is an important table that should be committed to memory. So it's broken down based on the time after onset of symptoms and whether or not it's a necrotizing pancreatitis or not, which is called interstitial edematous pancreatitis. So if it's less than four weeks after onset of symptoms, so that's acute, and it's an interstitial edematous pancreatitis, meaning no necrosis, a fluid collection would be called an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. So this has to just look like a simple fluid collection, simple fluid with nothing in it. If this fluid collection persists four weeks after onset of symptoms, it would be called a pseudocyst. And at that point, you'd start to be able to see a thin wall. Again, it would be a simple fluid collection with nothing in it. Now, in necrotizing pancreatitis, if it's less than four weeks after symptoms and you see a collection, it has to have something in it, fat, hemorrhage, any heterogeneity that's not simple fluid. That's when you would be thinking along the lines of necrosis. Um, that's what you would call an acute necrotic collection. And remember, you can get parenchymal necrosis, peripancreatic necrosis, or both, which is most common. So if this collection with any heterogeneity in it, not just simple fluid, persists for over four weeks after symptom onset, that's when you would call it walled up necrosis. And by that time, it'll start to have a wall. All of these collections can be sterile or infected. And it's tough to diagnose infection on CT. If you see air in the collection, that's when you would suggest it, but only 25% of these infected collections will have air. So now let's practice the nomenclature with some examples. This is a 79-year-old male who has an axial CT with IV and positive oral contrast. Here's a collection uh, in the region of the pancreas. You can see uh, the anterior part of it is simple fluid, but the posterior part is dense, and there's a little globule of fat in it. So this is a heterogeneous collection, so we're thinking along the lines of necrosis. This patient was discharged from the hospital two months prior, so what is the correct name of this collection? So this would be Waldorf necrosis. It falls over here on the table, so over four weeks after symptom onset, and it's a heterogeneous collection, so it falls under the necrotizing pancreatitis. Here's another example. This is a 69-year-old female with an axial CT with IV contrast. Here you can see there is a simple fluid collection. It's just fluid. There's nothing in it. Um, this patient presented with abdominal pain two weeks prior. So what is the correct name of this collection? And that is an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. That falls here on this table. So less than four weeks after symptom onset, and it is an interstitial edematous pancreatitis, so no necrosis. It's called an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. This is a 42-year-old male. This is an axial haste, so it's like a T2. You can see CSF is bright and the gallbladder is bright. Here is a simple fluid collection. This patient presented with abdominal pain two months prior, and you can see it's starting to have a little bit of a wall. What is the correct name of this collection? So it's a simple fluid collection, two months, so it's over four weeks after symptoms. This is called a pseudocyst, and that falls over here on the table. So... It looks like a cyst, so there's a lot of different cysts you can see in the pancreas. There's pseudocysts, there's IPMNs, uh, mucinous cystic neoplasms, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, other things can be cystic as well. So a lot of times, uh, patients will be recommended for an EUSFNA based on many things, maybe the size or complexity, for example, and that'll help with diagnosis. So what lab value will be elevated on an EUSFNA? And that's an amylase, and amylase can be seen in a pseudocyst. CEA is seen in a mucinous cystic neoplasm or adenocarcinoma. CA199 can be seen in a mucinous cystic neoplasm or adenocarcinoma. And CA724 can be seen in mucinous cystic neoplasm, and it's highly specific for that. Here's a companion case, a mucinous cystic neoplasm. Oftentimes, differentiating a pseudocyst from a mucinous cystic neoplasm can be difficult. So you definitely need history. If you have a history of recurrent pancreatitis, that'll lead you one way. And also a comparison with prior imaging a fluid collection arose in an episode of acute pancreatitis that'll lead you towards a pseudocyst. Neural calcification is a finding that you'll see in a mucinous cystic neoplasm, but not in a pseudocyst. Um, and of course, FNA uh, can lead you in the right direction, with amylase being seen in a pseudocyst and CEA, CA99, and a CA724 uh, being some of the things you can see in a mucinous cystic neoplasm. So this is a 44-year-old female. Uh, there's an axial CT with IV and a neutral oral contrast. You can see the body of the pancreas over here enhances completely. It looks normal size, and there's no peripancreatic fat stranding or fluid. But here, the head, you can see there's heterogeneity in the head. It is all enhancing, 
but there's some edema in the head. It's a little bit enlarged, and then there's some fluid all around, extending into the pancreaticoduodenal groove, with also some fat stranding. So this is an example of groove pancreatitis. So what's the cause of groove pancreatitis? That's pancreatic rust in the gastroduodenal groove. And this is when there's inflammation between the pancreatic head and duodenum, and the pancreatic parenchyma appears normal. There's no main duct dilation. And interestingly, the serum lipase may be normal or only slightly elevated because pretty much the pancreas looks fine, and it's strongly associated with heavy alcohol use. So that's it for acute pancreatitis. Now we'll move on to complications of acute pancreatitis. So this is an axial CT with IV and neutral oral contrast. You can see uh, there is a collection surrounding and involving the pancreas. It's heterogeneous. You can see it has fluid. It also has some denser areas and some fat globules. Uh, so this is a necrotizing pancreatitis. And then you can see the red arrow is pointing to some bubbles of air here. Uh, so this is infected pancreatic necrosis. Um, infection is not reliably diagnosed with CT, with only 25% of infected collections having gas at CT. So ultimately, FNA is required for diagnosis and management. Here's another example, axial CT with IV and positive oral contrast. Uh, surrounding and replacing the pancreas is a heterogeneous collection with dense areas, um, so it's pancreatic necrosis. You can see these air bubbles throughout, so this is infected pancreatic necrosis. And then the arrow is pointing to a blush of contrast that matches the aorta. So this is a pseudoaneurysm uh, arising from the gastroduodenal artery. Pseudoaneurysm diagnosis requires dynamic imaging, and it occurs in 10% of patients with acute pancreatitis. 40% of them are splenic, and 30% of them are gastroduodenal, and the treatment is embolization. This is an axial CT with IV contrast. You can see the pancreas is enlarged, and there's fluid surrounding it extending on both sides of the abdomen. So this is a Balthazar grade E pancreatitis. Um, there's no necrosis in this case, so this is an example of an acute interstitial pancreatitis, as described by the revised Atlantic classification. And the arrow is pointing to a partial splenic vein thrombosis over here. You can see a portion of the splenic vein enhancing, but a portion of it not enhancing. And splenic vein is, uh, occurs in 10 to 40% of cases. This is an example. The uh, dense portion in the posterior aspect is an example of hemorrhage, which may be from a pseudoaneurysm. So here's another example. This is a coronal MRCP. You can see there's a cyst, and then upstream, the main pancreatic duct is dilated. There's an area that's dis uh, discontinuous, and then uh, this portion is normal caliber. This is called disconnected duct syndrome, and it requires over two centimeters of pancreatic necrosis and viable pancreatic tissue upstream. Um, basically, the viable tissue will secrete uh, pancreatic enzymes, and that's what this disconnected duct syndrome is. To diagnose it, you have to demonstrate extravasated contrast inject injected through the main pancreatic duct, and you do it by ERCP or secretin MRCP. So the way it works is you have functioning pancreatic tissue isolated upstream from the necrosis, and you get leaking of pancreatic secretions, which will cause a persistent fistula and inflammatory collection. Most of these cases will require surgery, which is often resection of the disconnected segment upstream or a pancreatic jejunostomy to drain the uh, uh, disconnected segment. And in the same example, you can also see there's pancreatic biliary duct obstruction as well. Now we'll move on to chronic pancreatitis. So this is a 66-year-old male. This is a coronal haste, so it's like a T2. Here's the gallbladder, fluid-filled. This is a coronal through the pancreas, and you can see the main pancreatic duct is dilated with these T2 dark filling defects, which are intraductal stones, and you can see dilated uh, side branches um, as well. So those are findings of chronic pancreatitis. This is an axial CT with IV and neutral oral contrast in another patient with chronic pancreatitis. You can see there's parenchymal atrophy, intraductal stones, pancreatic parenchymal calcifications as well. Um, and here's another case. This is a coronal MRCP, heavily T2-weighted sequence. Uh, you can see dilated main pancreatic duct with dilated side branches. And actually, you can see there's a little crisscross here. This is the main pancreatic duct going to the minor papilla, and here is the common bile duct draining to the ampulla. So this is an example of pancreas divism, which is one of the causes of chronic pancreatitis. And last, we'll talk about autoimmune pancreatitis. So this is a 69-year-old female with an axial CT with IV and neutral oral contrast. Here you can see there's a mass in the tail of the pancreas. This segment looks relatively normal, but the duct over here is dilated with 
hyperdensity along both sides of the duct. You can see that over here. And then there's another mass in the head of the pancreas. But if you look close, you can see the duct actually penetrates through. Um, it's normal caliber in this segment, but you can see the hyperdensity along the wall. Uh, so this is called the penetrating duct sign. Usually when you think of a mass, you're always concerned about an adenocarcinoma, for example, but when the duct penetrates through, you know it's not going to be an adenocarcinoma, and rather it's an inflammatory process. So this is autoimmune pancreatitis, or IgG4 pancreatitis. Uh, you may see infiltration of IgG4-positive lymphocytes and pathology and an elevated serum IgG4. Typically, especially for the boars, you'll see a sausage appearance of the pancreas, which is diffuse pancreatic enlargement, and you'll see that in 40 to 60% of cases. And the pancreas may appear featureless with effacement of the lobular contour. And there may be a capsule-like rim or a halo of soft tissue around the pancreas, which you can see in 12 to 40% of cases. In the inflamed segments, you may see diffuse or segmental narrowing of the main pancreatic duct. And the penetrating duct sign, which I just showed you, is an important distinguishing factor uh, to differentiate from an adenocarcinoma. Atypical pancreatic findings that you may see, which are shown here, you can see the mass-like or segmental enlargement of the pancreas. Still, you see that in 30 to 40 percent of cases. Um, and the spared segment will have a dilated duct like you've seen here. There is an association with extra pancreatic manifestations, biliary in 80 percent of cases, renal in 35 percent, retroperitoneal fibrosis in 10 percent, and salivary gland involvement in 15 percent. And treatment is with steroids. There's two histologic subtypes of autoimmune pancreatitis. This is, uh, there's type 1, which is the lymphoplasmacytic sclerosing subtype, and type 2, which is the idiopathic duct-centric subtype. Type 1 will have an elevated IgG4, but type 2 will have a normal IgG4, so this is very difficult to diagnose. Type 1 has the extrapancreatic manifestations we just discussed, biliary, renal, sialadenitis, and retroperitoneal fibrosis, whereas type 2 is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And type 1, you get frequent relapse, 59%, whereas type 2, you get rare relapse. This is an 86-year-old female with a CT in 2010 and 2015. In 2010, you can see the pancreas is enlarged, and you can see a little bit of this halo around it over here. In 2015, you can see the pancreas is normal-sized without the halo. Uh, so what has been the inter intervention in the interim? So in this case of autoimmune pancreatitis, the patient received steroids, and that's the reason for the improvement in the appearance of their pancreas. So to conclude, we talked about some background information, the imaging findings of acute pancreatitis, specifically the Balthazar CT severity index and the revised Atlanta classification of fluid collections. We talked about complications, chronic pancreatitis, and autoimmune pancreatitis. Thank you.